Um, I think we're going to go ahead and start if you want to take your seat. Welcome. So, uh, good evening. I didn't think I would need a microphone. I still have a teacher voice, but there are a lot of people in the back that we want to make sure can hear. So, we will be using a mic. If it becomes a problem and you can't hear, let us know. We have uh, folks working on our sound um, up front. I do want to welcome everybody here tonight. Um, this is our first in the northern area community information session. We do have two of our main presenters tonight, but several people for, from uh, central office, what I call my cabinet, are also in the back. I probably won't introduce each one, but uh, they are back there if we need them. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Barbara Baker. I'm the superintendent of Garrett County Public Schools. I'm honored to have this position and have loved it and really try and do what is best for the students of Garrett County. I am a proud graduate of this school. I won't say when, but if you want to look in the halls and find it someday, um, I do uh, really remember fondly my time here at Northern Garrett High School. I do want to introduce our two presenters that I'll turn it over to in a few minutes. This is David Wolf. He is the architect from Grimm and Parker. On the Google Meet, we have Laura Smiles, also from Grimm and Parker, but she's on this computer. And then Nicole Miller, she's our chief academic officer. In the back, uh, in addition to my cabinet members, we have a couple of principals as well. And then I do want to introduce uh, Jason Van Sickle, I believe came in. He's uh, one of our board members. And then our newest board member right over here, uh, Josh Heinbaugh, will be sworn in on Tuesday evening. I'm glad you both could be here. I don't see any other board members. Are there anybody else in the back? OK. So we have had two, two, community meeting, or two committee meetings for the elementary level and two secondary committee meetings. Uh, one was bef two of them were before Christmas, and two of them were today. And the biggest question that has come up from those four meetings is, what's the timeline? When will this decision be made? And so I want to talk about that a little bit first before I turn it over to our main presenters. Uh, in February, uh, we presented a plan to the Board of Education, myself and my cabinet, that included realigning the grade bands at both the southern area and the northern area to a pre-K to 6, 7 through 12 model. At that time, we were also working through our needs of Broadford Elementary School and Southern Middle School. So at that time, the board decided to look at the southern area first which they did. We had some very comprehensive meeting and plans that we put forth, and they did vote to realign the grade bands in the southern area. So that brings us here tonight for our first community information session. And the answer of when they will vote, I don't know that answer. Uh, we have put a timeline to the board, but they want to make sure that we have plenty of time to gather feedback from the community and make sure that we provide as much information as possible. The one thing I know for sure is they will not vote Tuesday night. It will be at least February or March or maybe April before the final meeting or before the final decision is made for the grade band in the northern area. So this is our first evening. You will have at least one more session to do the community feedback, and we are considering another session if necessary. So, at this, so I just wanted to make sure I have heard a couple people ask about that as well. So at this time, if I've covered everything that we talked about, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Miller, and she'll start with the presentation. Thank you. You're welcome. Good evening. Um, just. Uh, just to introduce myself a little bit, I am Nicole Miller. I right now hold the role of Chief Academic Officer uh, with Garrett County Public Schools, and I'm also the Blueprint Coordinator. However, I also would like for you to know that I was the principal at Grantsville uh, for six years, and then moved to Southern High School. I uh, was the principal there for a few years before going to um, the central office. And I live on the northern end, and I have a little one who was born in June who is going to be going to northern end schools, um, Lord willing, but it'll be a couple years before we get there. 
So um, I do want you to know that because that's something that I think is very important um, to, to kind of just the context of my history here with the county. Um, we do have another person that will be presenting a, a portion of time. That's Miss uh, Allison Schweitzer. She's the director of finance. And then those that Miss Baker had referenced as far as cabinet, will have an opportunity if they if they need to answer a question or um, we need them to share on any particular topic, they may have an opportunity to do that as well. As Ms. Baker said, we have held several uh, committee meetings to date. Um, we have approximately uh, 50 people on those committees. It ranges from parents, students, um, teachers, administrators. So we have a, a wide lens and we're really using that time to analyze what a pre-K through six, seven through 12 grade ban would look like on the northern end should the elected board decide to go that route. So on the screen, you'll see the objectives for today. And we're gonna start with the purpose. So for tonight, what we are really looking to do is share information with you and solicit some feedback from you on what a pre-k through six and seventh through 12th grade band could look like on the northern end and you're going to see several options that we're analyzing we're in the feasibility stage what can it look like okay tonight is not really designed to be a time to argue for or against grade ban. You'll have an opportunity to do that, trust me. We will make sure you have an opportunity to do that. But tonight, we really want feedback that will help inform our analysis for the final recommendation to the elected board. So the insights that you can provide us, the feedback that you can provide us to help us develop an option that would be the best option, optimize student opportunities, et cetera, for students on the northern end, should we, at the end of the day, our system move to a pre-K through six, seven through 12. Ms. Baker referenced uh, at a later time, opportunity for public comment uh, in front of the elected board. That will be available to the northern end as well. We will do a special listening session uh, with the elected board, just like we did on the southern end. And that will be a time where you can come and argue whatever your opinion is uh, as far as if we should go down this road or not. But tonight we really would like to solicit ideas and thoughts on what you're gonna see tonight so that we can optimize that planning and make sure that we've considered all the things that we need to consider in designing this plan. So that's why we're here um, as far as tonight and the charge that is in front of us. How do I go forward? Here's my clicker. Um, oh, and I also wanna just review real quick. You see here that we're gonna talk about three options tonight. Okay, option A, B, and C. They all offer different challenges and different opportunities. Some of them have more opportunities and less challenges. Some of them have more challenges and less opportunities. So we're looking at all three of them. We're gonna share an analysis of option A and B. Option A and B, both of those options do not require any type of significant renovation or limited renovation. They're really administrative decisions. Um, think they're options that we can do in our current footprint that doesn't require um, a, a major change to a facility, okay? Option C does require a limited renovation, and you'll see that. It'll require a limited renovation to Northern Middle School as well as Northern High School. That's the option that Mr. Wolf and Laura Smiles will be speaking to. Uh, they are working through Grimm and Parker, and they are experts in design, renovation, architecture, and we need their expertise to help formulate what that plan could look like. So they're gonna speak largely to that option. But you will see that we are gonna review the committee feedback that was shared prior to Christmas. Today, we solicited additional committee feedback, so we will be compiling that after tonight and, uh, and considering all of that in our final plan, as well as feedback that we receive uh, from you all um, as we move forward. Okay, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over uh, to Ms. Schweitzer to talk a little bit about why are we even here um, talking 
about the potential of a pre-K through six, seven through 12 grade ban. Good evening. Can you can you hear me? I am not a teacher. I never was. So um, I don't do this a lot. Um, so I'm Allison Schweitzer. I'm the director of finance with Garrett County Public Schools. Uh, I am a native of Garrett County. I'm a, a graduate of Southern High School, and I have three children in the system. So the reason that we are here this evening, it's kind of a long time coming, but we are we as the uh, management team for uh, Mrs. Baker have been looking at this as the perfect storm. So there are several external factors that are occurring right, and they're all converging right now, and something has to be done. So so those factors um, are legislation that's called the Blueprint for Maryland's Future. Um, it is now. Um, it is now law, and we are required to implement it. Uh, there are sweeping changes to the way that we do business uh, that are required from this legislation. We have also experienced declining enrollment uh, as far back as the Maryland Department of Planning has data for us. Uh, we average 1.7% uh, per year decline. And unfortunately for us, it's not they don't leave in nice, neat little pieces. Fourth grade from one grade. They trickle out all throughout our 12 schools. So over time, that causes, that causes some of these issues. Uh, our revenue and budget, um, you know, our revenue is based upon the number of students that we have enrolled in Garrett County Public Schools. So as that number declines, our revenue either stays the same, which is flat, or it declines slightly. Um, and then the state capital program has changed over the years, and with our aging infrastructure of our facilities, it's becoming more and more challenging for us to receive state participation in capital projects, roofs, boilers, air conditioning, those kinds of things for our facilities. Hold, hold on. Does the blueprint not come with additional funding? So the blueprint has very, very specific um, amounts per pupil. And we will get to that a little bit further down the road. So um, I will answer that, but not this moment. How about that? Okay, so here is the blueprint. Uh, we're not gonna talk about the funding yet. We're still gonna talk about the overarching legislation. So it is um, divided into five pillars, and we have our blueprint coordinator right here, Dr. Miller. Uh, we also have the executive committee pretty much here today represented. Um, but the, the big thing is that within each of those pillars, early childhood education, high quality and diverse teachers and leaders, uh, college and career readiness, more resources for students, and governance and accountability. It is requiring all school systems in the state of Maryland to change the way they do business. In the classroom, as well as centrally, we're required to do it differently. We're accountable for our students' results, and we're reporting a, a lot more and different things than we ever have. Um, so the state is really dictating a lot of these changes through this legislation. So the state capital grant program um, has changed uh, in the last, uh, I don't know, five years, but the biggest piece of change was a, a piece of legislation called the Built to Learn Act. Um, and so there are, there's a piece of funding through the Built to Learn Act for school construction. 
Uh, and Garrett County does have a, a piece allocated to us that we have not used yet. Um, but anytime the state allocates more funding, they always want something in return. They want information. They want to make sure that we are spending taxpayer dollars in a prudent manner. So with the Built to Learn Act, there was a lot of studies that were done on all the facilities, all 1,400 facilities in the state of Maryland. They were all ranked against each other with this very high-tech system and prioritized on a statewide level. Um, so one of the big things that did happen with the Built to Learn Act that was a positive for Garrett County is that the legislation was changed in a way that our state and local split on spending for school construction is now the same as our uh, county to the east, Allegheny County, which is favorable. That means that we're now at a 90% state participation and a 10% local participation. That's huge. However, when you take a project to the state, they evaluate it a whole lot uh, more stringent, stringently than they did in the past. And they start to ask a lot more questions about adjacent schools and the capacity and your total cost of ownership. And so you, we're, at, we're answering a lot more questions about our facilities. So as they're underutilized, it's making it more and more difficult to obtain that state funding. When you look at the funding formula for state capital programs, it always starts with the eligible enrollment projection. So that means when you have a, a school that may only have 112 students in it, that's your starting factor, De it, regardless of the square footage of the, of the building. So that, that's kind of a barrier for us here in the North. The third factor is the student enrollment. And you can see here, we've provided a 10-year history of our decline. Um, but over that period of time, um, we have, this is, does not include pre-K. I just want to make sure that everyone's aware of that. And one of the reasons is because we don't receive funding the same for pre-K as we do for kindergarten through 12th grade. So that's one of the reasons why you don't see pre-K. But um, unfortunately, we have declined, and all indications are that we will continue to decline. Uh, each spring, we are required by law to uh, sync up with the Maryland Department of Planning and kind of agree on a projection of what our enrollment will look like. The Maryland Department of Planning works with our county's planner first, and so they gather all the information on what's happening with economic development, what's happening with births, um, the birth rate, the everything with the census, and then we work on a projection together. So unfortunately, it does look as if the Garrett County will continue um, in this about 1.5 to 1.7% um, decrease annually. With respect to the northern end, um, we did provide here the, um, the variances in the graduating classes because that's one of the, we get a lot of questions about the reasons we're losing enrollment. And one of the reasons that we just can't do anything about is that our graduating classes are decreasing over time. But each year, the graduating class from Northern High School maybe 120 kids, but the incoming kindergarten class may only be 100. So right there, you've got a variance of the students that are leaving our system versus the students that are entering our system. That has nothing to do with any of the other parent choices or locations that people are deciding to live in. It's just the way, it, way it's happening. So then the final, um, factor of the perfect storm is our budget. So by law, we are required to 
have a balanced budget, that means that the revenues we receive, all the money from the county commissioners, from the state, uh, and from any other funding sources must equal the expenditures that we plan to spend. So with the declining enrollment, the best we can hope for really with our revenue is like flat, which is a very similar or declining. Unfortunately with flat, that means we're not getting more dollars year over year. And with the high inflationary rate that we have right now, um, that means that just like in your home budget, you can buy less with the same amount of money year over year. So even if we keep the, the school's budgets the same, the cost of our staff is increased, the cost of our healthcare may be increased, but also the, color, the cost of red crayons is more than it was last year. You know, so, so the, the inflation is really a, a big factor. Um, we also have staffing challenges. Um, not everybody wants to live in a rural community. And so it's difficult to find quality candidates to fill our staffing positions. Um, we, also, we also have a funding cliff with the, the COVID relief fund that we've received. Um, I'm sure you've heard a lot about the recovery money that Garrett County has received. Garrett County, as a county, has received money. The health department has m received money, and also uh, Garrett County Public Schools. Uh, we've been able to do a lot of really great things uh, with that money, with that funding, but unfortunately, it will be ending, and we are going to need to make the difficult decisions whether or not some of those programs continue or whether they don't, and if they continue, then we have to make those difficult decisions. What do you cut so that you can do that? Because just like your home budget, we're not getting more money just because we want more money. You know, it's kind of like making a decision to own three cars because you it's convenient. Well, now the funding has run out, so we can really only afford two cars. That's kind of, that's kind of, I guess, a, one way to, to talk about it. And then the blueprint for Maryland's future implementation requirements. One of the big things with that in pillar two for teacher leaders is that uh, we are required to increase our salaries pretty substantially for Gator County. Um, by 2027, we are required to have a starting salary of $60,000 for teachers. And that's not going to be an isolated increase to our salary uh, cost because, you know, it's not fair for teachers to make more money, but the instructional assistants to stay the same as they are now. You know, so all boats need to rise. Um, unfortunately, we're we're not, we're not able to get the money that we're getting for the teacher salaries that we are for the other uh, support personnel. Okay, so here we're gonna talk about your funding question, okay? So the question was, are we getting more money through the blueprint? We are getting more money per pupil, okay? And the per pupil amounts are hard-coded in law. They go out 10 years. And the way that it's, it's structured is Maryland has changed to a weighted student funding model. And what that means is there's a base per pupil amount, that's this first block, and it's called the foundation. So every student, kindergarten through 12, receives this funding. It's a little over $8,000. Then you add, based upon the demographics of the student, there's an additional funding piece for that student. So if the student has an IEP and is a special education student, there is a weighted factor that's added to that. Then there are also program amounts that, and, and we, Gare County only qualifies for one of the program amounts. And it's just a flat amount, doesn't matter how many students we have, it doesn't matter how many schools we have, it doesn't matter 
any of those factors. It's hard coded in the legislation and we receive that funding. So this is a deep dive into weighted student funding because it's kind of a hard concept to think about if you're not a math person like, like I am. So one way to think about it is student D is your regular run-of-the-mill kid. I have three of them, three student Ds, and we receive $8,310 for my student D. That is combined state and lo local funding. That foundation amount, that base amount, is supposed to cover the school building and its operation, operational class, the classroom teacher, the principal, the guidance counselor, um, all the custodians. Uh, am I thinking of any? I'm not. Um, instructional assistants, um, support staff, uh, the nurse. It's supposed to cover the nurse too. So that's that's what you get for a student D. Now, depending on the subgroup that or the demographics of each student, we receive different weights or different amounts of money for those students. So student A has an IEP, it's a he is a special ed student. He also qualifies for free and reduced meals. So that student would also receive the comp ed funding. So that student has three different funding sources and comes to a total of $22,853 for that student. Now, that $22,853 must follow that student to the school that that student attends. Yes, so that amount must be spent at the school at a minimum 75%. So 25% is the only amount that we have wiggle room with. Then you got student B. Student B is also a special ed student, also gets the base, but is a second grader. So they have this other piece of funding that gets $665. So, but they're a second grader, not a fifth grader. So what we spend that $665 on has to be in second grade at that school. It cannot be for the fifth grader. So you can see that each student kind of comes with a little different amount of money. Now that's just the in portion. We have to plan for the spending by school, by program, and then we have to monitor as the year goes on. So we're gonna rely on our teachers to help us make sure that they're doing what we planned they would do and then at the end, we have to report on it to make sure that we, were, we spent at that school level. Yes, but you have to talk into this. Thank you. Okay, what is the break-even cost per student that you need to cover all the things that you're talking about? Well, the break-even is different for every single school. Because every, I shouldn't st stand in front of that. The break-even point is different for every single school the way they are today. Now remember, the 75% is a minimum. Right now, we are spending over on all of the northern schools. We are out of compliance on some of the southern schools. So that means that we have to kind of shift the way we're spending our dollars. First time caller, long time listener. Um, I'm wondering now, what is the 10 year horizon you talked about at the beginning? So you said this is like for 10 years. So how do you, I, I understand the planning challenge for that, but what do you mean by 10 years? So the amounts 
that you see here. So it, it is hard to see. Um, I don't know if we can turn that light off, but the foundation is $8,310 in FY22. And it goes up to like $8,963 in FY24. And so in legislation, it has it written what the dollar amount is for that base amount. Do you understand what I'm saying? But then the weights are a percentage of that base. So it may be like 75% this year, but then it drop, jumps up to like 83% the following year. But then the kicker is that in certain years, it starts to go down. So then it's, it's a lower percentage of the base. There are a lot of reasons why it might go down. So does that help? Can you, can, can you see that a little bit better? Or is it too dark? Better? Not better? Okay. Okay. I don't know what my, what's the next slide? So one of the one of the points that I'm being told I didn't make was that while the base amount, that foundation amount, is going to increase over the next 10 years, unfortunately, that increase is not high enough to overcome the decrease that we're having in the first factor because you're taking that number of students times that number to even start. So we, we do have data for two years on what it looks like for our school system under this model. We didn't have to live under this model until next year. So the budget we're creating right now, the budget we're working on for fiscal year 2024 that starts July 1st of 2023, we will have to live under this weighted student model. Right, and one of the reasons why the break-even point would be different for every school is because the makeup of every school is different. So we have different numbers of special education students, different numbers of farm students, different numbers of, of populations, that, uh, a number of second graders, first graders. Um, so that obviously impacts um, the, the total amount as well. One thing I will add, and we'll go ahead, where's my clicker? Here we go specific to the blueprint because the blueprint is a massive piece of legislation and it is going to change the way we do business in education it's going to change the way business is done in education across the state that is required it is by law we have to do it i would really encourage you all to take advantage of some of the upcoming uh, ways that we're going to try to educate the community on the blueprint because it is it is 300 plus page pages it's a lot of legislation to read and it's very it will very much put you to sleep at night if you try to read it at night um, but we just started this week releasing infographics per pillar that talk about what the goals are for each pillar we have early childhood pillar teacher leader pillar infographics are going to come out on every single pillar that will talk about what the goals are what some of the changes are going to be and what the current committee work is um, occurring right now because we have committees for each pillar as we work on this implementation the other thing we're going to do next tuesday at the board meeting we will have our first public blueprint information session. We have a very substantial presentation that is going to share information uh, and resources about the blueprint so that if you're interested in learning more, there will be links that you can click on and you can read about it and learn more about it. And I would encourage you, if you're not able to watch the um, board meeting or attend the board meeting we will be uh, clipping that part of the um, the meeting the presentation just on blueprint and we'll be posting that on our website so you'll just be able to see that it'll be easy access um, to do that we are also planning on i got you i'll give you yep um, we're also going to be doing a blueprint information series with our staff and we're going to record those and we're going to post those online as well. So there are going to be a number of opportunities for you to learn more about the blueprint 
and its impacts, and um, and we encourage you to do that. There'll also be ways for you to um, share feedback on it as well. So that is moving very fast, and tonight is not about Blueprint, but I did feel like I needed to share that because I think it's important for all of us to educate ourselves on the impact of that legislation on our county, um, and some things are gonna be coming out. They're already start, they already started earlier this week, and they'll be continuing to come out over the course of the next two months as we work on our initial plan we will have multiple plans because this is a 10-year uh, legislative process. My question is, if we have questions locally about the blueprint, are you our contact person or is there a general, like I know we had the green band alignment at Gear County Board of Ed, or is there an email address for the blueprint that we can ask those questions to? There is actually an email address, blueprint at Garrett County, uh, GarrettCountySchools.org. You can also email me directly, Nicole.Miller. I'm the person who receives the blueprint um, email um, messages. Um, so if you would like to send questions, that is certainly um, an avenue to do so. Okay. So Ms. Baker said she's jotting down questions as we go as well so that we can kind of keep a running record. Um, so if there are questions, please, please share tonight as well. All right, so back to grade band alignment. Um, we've been working on grade band alignment for over a year, investigating um, the benefits and challenges and opportunities uh, throughout our system, but we also visited some systems that are actually implementing a pre-K through six, seven through 12 model um, to really educate ourselves and uh, understand some of the pieces that we're gonna have to navigate to smoothly transition our system in this direction should it be adopted by our elected board. So we, we've been looking at educational opportunities, legislative mandates with the blueprint, our special education services, our mental health services, and just in general, our, our uh, non-instructional side of the house, so our support side of the house, which is like uh, transportation, food, nutrition, and such. So as we've been working through that process, we have identified a number of additional opportunities uh, that we would like to look at. Um, these are possible educational opportunities under a pre-K through six model, seven through 12. And let me preface um, this whole section with, if our system would decide to do nothing with our footprint, with our facilities, that's not doing nothing. That is making a, con a concerted, uh, a conscious decision to keep what we have, and there will be consequences to that decision based on all of these external factors that are coming and converging um, all together. So doing nothing is not doing nothing. Our hope is to mitigate some of these factors that we're having to navigate to to, to shift our school system into a system that we can add opportunities rather than decrease opportunities. We are very confident at this point based on the data that we have that keeping our current footprint is not very sustainable and will likely result in increased class sizes and cut programs. And our system has been through that before. It was 10 years ago excuse me, 10 years ago and 15 years ago, but our system has been through that before. And our hope in the strategy that we're taking at this point is to look at what can we do to continue our school system being a thriving school system, being a school system that offers more opportunities to our students to prepare our students to be college and career ready and be successful in life rather than less. So what you see on the screen is very small. This will be publicly posted as well. There's a page on our webpage that you can find all this information. But these are a number of possible educational opportunities that we believe we can capitalize on should we make substantial changes in our county as a result of these converging factors. They range from anything from providing computer science resource to upper elementary students, media specialists to resource students at the elementary level, makers spaces, um, uh, early childhood centers and um, outdoor learning opportunities, collaborative spaces, um, stability in class size. So this comes up 
a lot, and I'm going to take this opportunity. I, I, I say that I, I'll talk to anyone who will listen to me about this. I'm going to take the opportunity, because I have a captive audience. There is a thought within our community that putting more students under one roof equals increased class size, and that is false. What it does do is create more flexibility in how we schedule and how we staff, and it stabilizes class size. It decreases the variance in class size. And I'll give you an example. On the northern end, we have a variance in class size at the elementary level from 12 to 31. That's a, that's a substantial variance, right? And there's a lot of factors that go into how we are required to, to staff and ensure that we have appropriate, adequate staffing at each school. But that's the reality, and that's largely due to the fact that we have many singleton schools, and when I say singleton, I mean schools that have one class per grade. And then when you have declining enrollment, it compounds those things. So as principal at Grantsville, 10, years, 10 plus years ago, I came in when there was two classes per grade at Grantsville. We had about 240 students. Ms. Baker was the principal when they were at 280. Okay, I started with those two classrooms per grade. When I left, we were almost a singleton school. And what that means is that w when you start getting classes that are at 28, 29, 30, and you look at all the factors, because your, your enrollment's declining, it's not quite enough for two classes when you look at the, all the other factors and, and requirements that we have to fall within when we're doing staffing and the funding piece. So accident is in that situation right now, okay? Grantsville has lived that. They've turned into virtually a singleton school at this point. They have two pre-Ks, everything else is single. Accident is starting the same path that Grantsville was in 10 years ago. And they have a declining enrollment where they've traditionally always had two classes per grade. This year, there are two grades that have one class. And in some cases, those are higher numbers. But we are held to other restrictions that kind of somewhat tie our hands to those types of things as well. So we have to make difficult choices at the, at the end of the day. So I'm gonna get off that ramp, but I just, I needed to say that Putting more students under the same roof does not equal increased class size. And to go back to the variance 12 and 30, 31 or 12 and 29, when you take a class of 12 and a class of 29 or 30 and you put them together under one roof, you now have two classes of 21, 22, much more palatable for an elementary school. Okay, and probably more what we would want. I don't think anyone wants 31, and we don't either. Okay, go ahead. Testing. Living it uh, at accident as a parent of a student in a 31 teacher class. Teacher's amazing. See her over there. What are the projections for class sizes in this scenario of grade band? across the board. Can you give us an idea? You said that right now in the different schools, they're between 12 and 31. Is there a, is there a general number that we can expect? Sure. So by board policy, we do not have a class size policy. I'm just going to put that out there so that everybody is aware of that. There are different projections for each of these option A, B, and C. Option A and B we're looking at more and more class sizes of 31. We also are projecting that at some point with an option A or B, that we would be looking at split classes where it might be a kindergarten and a first grade, but then second and third are in one class, one grade, one class together, and fourth and fifth are in one class together. That's a, that's a real possibility when we look at the 10, year, 10 years out with what en enrollment looks like and what we can do with those dollars that we talked about with the weighted student funding, 
that would be allocated to that school based upon the demographics of those, those students. So if we go with the option C, which is the one everybody's pushing towards from my understanding, is the board going to look at possibly putting a classroom size cap on this in the future? Or are we still possibly looking at if we have 24 at the end of one season going into the next and four families move and now it's a class of 30, leaving it like that for the whole year? Right, so we consider the student needs um, every year. We look at staffing, we look at the number of staff that we're gonna have in any given school. And I have also had the experience of class um, reduction during the middle of the school year, and I've also had the experience of adding a class during the school year. So it does happen. We, we have done that, we did it at Grantsville on two different occasions. So it's not impossible to add staff during the year or in my case, when I first started, they decreased after the school year started based on the way the enrollment um, happened. So um, I don't know that we will ever have a cap. However, what I will say is when you have more students under one roof, you have more flexibility to even those things out. And so when you look at a school like, I'll use Broadford as an example, sometimes we have four classes per grade. Sometimes we have three classes per grade. On average, anywhere between 20, 18 and 22, okay? When you have more students under one roof, the changes in enrollment, don't you don't feel them as much because there's a more of a population and they can be spread out across classes. Does that make sense? Yeah. And also I will say the only cap that I will say that will be by law is pre-K. Pre-K uh, three and pre-K four, according to the blueprint, it is expected and required that in order to get the funding for pre-K, that is specified in the law, you have to be at no more than 20. And there's a teacher and an assistant minimum, okay? So back to opportunities. We talked a little bit about elementary. I wanna highlight the secondary over here. One of the most significant opportunities we have here is adding uh, high school credit for eighth graders so that students have the opportunity to take high school credits and earn those credits towards graduation so that they can kind of get that jump start on the next phase in their life. One that we added to this list as of today that we explored, uh, we found out before break, before the Christmas break, um, after our last committee meeting and, and we added it today is that we are able to offer JROTC to eighth graders. Um, that was one that was added. We have to jump through some hoops and they have to be co-located in the same building as, as um, ninth through 12th grade. Um, but th those are especially important. And I'll tell you why that's important when it comes to the blueprint. The blueprint is requiring an accelerated path and it's requiring a support path for students who are not prepared or ready for that college and career readiness. If students can take some high school credits that are required graduation credits in eighth grade, then that puts them, it, it puts them ahead of the game to meet college and career readiness and have access to some of the post CCR opportunities that we have, uh, that we're gonna be required to have. So we are gonna have to offer the opportunity of an associate's degree. We're gonna have to offer an opportunity for an advanced um, placement uh, diploma of sorts. Um, and, and in order to earn those things, you're gonna need to get started. There's gonna have to be an accelerated path. The other thing is for students who are not college and career ready, we have to offer support paths. Well, if students are taking support paths, then they're not necessarily able to get some of the other classes that they would traditionally have gotten in the past. So if they can get a high school credit in an eighth grade, that's one credit that is behind them, that then if they need to take a support path course, they have room in their schedule to do so. Do we have a schedule uh, question back here? Question or a statement. 
When do we stop pushing our kids so fast? We are here to teach them, to let them grow. They're children. Now we're eighth grade and we're trying to worry about them graduating. It's too fast. you got to slow it down. We're pushing them out of school before they even get a chance to learn anything. And, and I appreciate your statement. And I know that everybody's going to have a different opinion on that, most, most likely. Um, but we do have students that are ready. And we're required by law to do it. And what it's going to mean is that some of our seniors are going to be off our campus. They're going to be doing apprenticeships. They're going to be doing things at uh, Garrett College. And, and that is something that is a reality in the next 10 years. That's across the state. And we certainly, well, first of all, we can't by law hold them back. But secondly, I can't, and I don't think Ms. Baker would, would be OK with not allowing that opportunity for our students to keep up with the rest of the state and what the rest of the state is doing and what's being afforded to those students across the state. So. I do appreciate the perspective, but we do have to look at this when it comes to um, the blueprint. Okay. Yeah. And it has been. Yeah. yeah. So the expectation with the blueprint is that we have our students college and career ready by the end of 10th grade. That is what is coded in law. That's the expectation of the blueprint. And if they're not, college and career ready by the end of 10th grade, we have to put a support path in place to support them in getting college and career ready. And th then the, the goal obviously is before graduation at that point. Um, but that's what we're gonna be held accountable to. So our school system will be held accountable to as they monitor the implementation of the blueprint. How will they do the, like, the eighth grade middle school credits and the high school credits at the same time? So a lot of the credits that you see there are electives. So we're going to have to look at our master schedule. We're going to have to have a common master schedule under one, one school, one building, one common schedule. And once that common schedule is established, then there would be opportunity to take electives outside of um, like the, the, the requirements that we have to have for middle school. Um, for, for academics, we do it with algebra already. We have a modified course progression to allow students to move quicker through math um, to be able to attain algebra in eighth grade. We will be looking at a similar model for English um, for those who are ready, not for all students, for those who are ready. So we're going to do one more, but then we're going to move on because we're going to run out of time tonight. Um, and this is an overview. And you'll have other opportunities. Oh, boy. Um, Thank you, sir. Can you tell me what percentage of our children go to college compared to that go directly into the field to work? Uh, Mr. Shope, isn't there something on our Maryland report card that talks about post-secondary? I know I'm putting you on the spot, but is that accurate? <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to directly quote numbers right now, but uh, the Maryland State report card has uh, typically five-year trend data related to what they are calling post-CCR pathways or um, you know, students that have left us and then they track what they actually do. Again, I'm not gonna quote you numbers, but you will see a trend that each year a student has left us, the percentage actually goes up that they go into a post-secondary pathway. Meaning we might have our percentage when they first graduate is higher of them going to work, but then after two or three years pass, that percentage of them seeking uh, an associate's degree from Garrett or taking trades in industry school, like getting, because that counts actually for the post-secondary, that percentage does trend upward. Um, but it is higher that they go to work when they first exit here, but then it, like I said, it is five year, uh, five year trend data. I would go out and look at it, and, and I would also um, say that that is data that has been refreshed by the state of Maryland, because a lot of the scoring data that is up on the Maryland report card has not been refreshed because of the pandemic and being off the testing cycle. But that is definitely information that's there, so. And I would say equally Im important is uh, being ready for career. That's a huge part of uh, the, the blueprint as well and the pr apprenticeship um, 
program that we'll be required to have, along with CTE programs that have industry certifications so that when a student has completed a CTE program, they're ready to walk into the industry and be successful at a high standard, okay? All right, you, you can read these others at your, um, at your leisure. These are, this is just a simply a list of programs that are not required. Things that we do that we think are important for our students, but they're not required. They're either not graduation requirements or they're not required under the blueprint or any other statute. So those things we are gonna obviously have to look at depending on what the decision is as far as our footprint and what efficiencies we might be able to gain by addressing our footprint issues. The other concern that is very um, significant is that we, we are anticipating a pretty significant added value being able to be had at the southern end with a pre-K through 6, 7 through 12 grade model. If we keep a, a different grade model on the northern end, we do not believe we're going to be able to attain those same opportunities. And that is putting us in a situation where there are increased inequities as far as student opportunity. And that is a very big concern uh, moving forward. We do think that no matter where you live in Garrett County, you should have opportunities uh, that are similar. So let's get into the actual meat of the spacing and these options. So this slide basically shows our northern footprint. I think everybody in the room knows what our northern footprint looks like. This slide are our current elementary facilities. We have four of them. These are the current enrollments, the current state rated capacity, and square footage. State rated capacity is usually abbreviated with the SRC, so you'll see SRC a lot in these slides. And the enrollment that you see on these slides is as of 9-30-2022. On 9-30 in every year, September 30th, it's a, it's a, it's one of those reporting times that we report our enrollment to uh, the state. And that's an important date and it's a consistent date. So we wanted to use consistent enrollment for all these schools, so that's the date we chose. The other thing I'll say is that this is the current state rated capacity. State rated capacity is calculated based on how space is utilized in a school. So if it's used as a first grade classroom, it gets counted let's say number 23, 23 slots, 23 students, okay? If it's a special ed classroom, it only gets 10. If it's uh, a first grade, well, sorry, if it's a kindergarten classroom, I think, I don't know if Mr. Westlowski is back there, but I think it's 22, yeah. And then pre-K, I think is 20. So how we configure the use of space in a building informs what the state rated capacity is for the building. So what you see on this slide is our current state rated capacity that has been submitted as far as our educational facilities master plan currently for this year. The projected ones that you'll see later will uh, be what we project that state rated capacity to be based on use of space should the footprint change. This is the secondary schools on the northern end. And then these are the three options that we're uh, analyzing at this time. With all of these options, it assumes that Northern High School would be a 7th through 12th grade. And it would require a reconfiguration of space with a limited renovation in order to provide an appropriate educational space for our 7th and 8th grade within the current uh, Northern High School. Option A, B, and C assume that that Northern High School would be seven through 12. So A, B, and C dictates, well, what happens at the elementary level then and with Northern Middle School? So if you look at option A, option A is looking at maintaining four Northern elementary schools at a pre-K through six, and then a seven through 12 high school. So Grantsville, Accident, Friendsville, Route 40. That would require a reconfiguration of space to accommodate sixth grade at all of those schools and looking at pre-K for three-year-olds where possible. It would also assume that we would vacate Northern Middle School. Option B is looking at maintaining three Northern elementary schools. So Accident and Friendsville, 
the same as option A, and then Grantsville would, Grantsville and Route 40 would be consolidated into Grantsville. So we'd have Grantsville with Route 40's enrollment inside, and then accident in Friendsville. It would assume that we'd have to reconfigure spaces at Grantsville to accommodate Route 40 student enrollment, and then all of the three elementary schools would be uh, pre-K through six. It would also assume that we vacate Northern Middle and Route 40. And then option C is the one that we're working with Grimm and Parker on because it does require some limited renovations. It looks at maintaining one current facility as an elementary school, which would be the Grantsville facility with Route 40 in it. And then it looks at completing a limited renovation of Northern Middle School to accommodate accident in Friendsville at a pre-K th uh, three through sixth grade. That would require some lim limited renovations of Northern Middle School as well, and it would assume that we would vacate Accident, Friendsville, and Route 40. So our footprint would significantly change. So those are the three options that we're analyzing. There are, I'm sure, other ways to, there's probably other options that could be looked at, but these are the three that we're analyzing at this, at this time. I can't hear anything that I hear someone talking, but I can't hear where they're talking. who's talking. Okay. <laughs> so I just want to make sure I understand all the grade alignments would put seventh graders and eighth graders in with 12th graders in the same building. And you think that's a recipe for success. So first, I would go back to the blueprint is going to change how we do business in our schools. And seniors are going to be doing different things than they're doing now, a lot of them, not all of them. And when we talk to other schools that are 7 through 12, the very first thing, we took a team to two different schools, the very first thing the principals, both principals, said to our team is that we know what the concerns are going to be. The very first concern from the community is going to be um, concern with 7th and 8th graders mixing with, with 12th graders. It was their co community concern as well. And what they indicated to us is that it's not an issue. It doesn't happen. It's, it's a benefit, not a hindrance. And, and Okay. Yeah, and we will duly note that concern. Right now, we do have pre-K on buses all the way up through uh, with with twelfth graders. We currently have that on our busing, and we have taken that consideration in our approach of what you're going to see later today. So there, there are maps and configurations of what a 7th through 12th would look like, and there are strategies that we've employed to help mitigate those concerns. So let us get through the presentation and show you that information before, before making um, an initial judgment, OK? Um, OK, we'll do one more, and then we're going to continue to go through slides. Did you only look at schools that were successful with 7 through 12, or did you look at other schools that were 7 through 12 that weren't as successful to see what challenges they saw that you could possibly have considered in this? Because if you only looked at successful ones, I don't think you're getting a full picture. So there was a school in West Virginia, Petersburg, and then a school in Pennsylvania, Rockville. Rockville. Um, you know, the 7th through 12th grade model is not an unusual model in Pennsylvania and in rural settings. It's not so much about where you put students, and I know that's maybe, you, you may disagree with that, but it, it really is not as much about where you put students, it's what you do with students where they're at. There are positive, 7th through 12th grades that are very successful. There are 7th through 12th grades that are not as successful performance-wise. The same thing's true for pre-K through 5, 6 through 8, 
and 9 through 12. There are schools across the state that are 9 through 12 that are not successful. There are 6 through 8 that are not successful and pre-K through 5. It doesn't matter what grade band you look at. You can find examples of what is successful and what is not. There's going to be examples on both sides. But that's why I say it's about what we do, where we put kids. So we're going to go ahead and continue through. Um, how do I do the laser? Push the red button. OK, thank you. OK, so <clears throat> we're on option A. We're looking at four elementary schools, pre-K through six, in option A, and then a seven through 12. So this is one configuration of classrooms for Accident Elementary. You'll notice that it says projected SRC. Um, some of the SRCs changed based on how we used the, the space and the projected enrollment as well. That's a high projection. That's considering the 930 count and then looking at the current fourth grade and adding that to it. Um, more than likely, that's a high projection based on the trends. Um, but what I will say, this is, this is one way of doing this. So uh, Mr. Weslowski, myself, and Ms. Ashby walked the um, elementary schools right after break to look at how we're currently using these spaces and talked with the principals about where would we put a sixth grade if we needed to put a sixth grade at your school. These are the two spaces that we identified as flexible space. That doesn't mean that if we go with that model that that's where the sixth grade will be. The principal always has the opportunity to readjust classroom assignments based on the needs of the school based on the number of students and factors that are current and relevant to that population. But you can see uh, that we do have the ability to fit a sixth grade should we need to. And really, that's showing the two sixth grades. There are situations that it would be just one sixth grade um, based on the class. The other thing that we wanted to show for each of the elementary schools on the north are what the current building needs are. Because that's another factor. I know tonight we've been talking a lot about the blueprint and the requirements and the funding and what we're going to be required to do with, with student weighted funding. But we also have to acknowledge and be aware of what our capital needs are in regards to what these buildings need to be educationally sufficient for our students. Um, so this is just a list. It's from the Educational Facilities Master Plan and Maintenance Plan for uh, educational facilities in Garrett County. Um, these are things, areas that are pretty big ticket areas that accident is going to need to have addressed uh, in the near future. And when we look at Friendsville, we wanted to look at sixth grade at that school as well. You can see all of the, the statistics on the side. One thing I will draw attention to about Friendsville is this map is misleading. Looks like there's walls where there's not walls and these blocks uh, are pods that are designed to be two classrooms um, but it's an open space school that's how it was designed many years ago I don't know the exact date it was built but it was many years ago I think maybe in the 70s 60s or 70s something like that um, and it's not been renovated so you can see the one pod Mr. Friend kind of identified at this time as sixth grade right now. Um, fourth grade is there. He would make a fourth and fifth grade pod in order to accommodate. But there's, there's plenty of room in Friendsville to accommodate additional students either way. I might be jumping the gun with this question, but do we have a budget? for what option A is going to be, option B, and option C, and are we going to be able to see those numbers? Ms. Schweitzer. So right now, we are in the feasibility stage of this, um, of this project. And so through the community listening session that's happening tonight, and then also the committee work that we've done um, on the 21st and then also today, we're really diving into what the actual needs are, the one-time needs as well as the recurring, ongoing operational costs. So we have high-level idea, 
But with the information we gather at, during this war work, we will have those costs when we present to the board um, for, for their vote. Friendsville, um, this is a list of their, their needs. The, the, the takeaway really for Friendsville is Friendsville needs a uh, completely renovated. It, that's, that's just being fully transparent. You know, an open space school is a significant concern and a lot of its um, systems are reaching end of life. Um, so that's where we're at with Friendsville. So the question is, if we go with option A, four elementary schools open, 7th through 12th at the um, high school, what happens to Northern Middle School? Well, we'd have to vacate it. It would be, it would be closed, essentially, and it would go back to the uh, county. When we close a school, it goes back to the county. So the commissioners would make a decision from there. Right now, like, is sixth grade is smart enough? They can do seventh grade math. How will they do that if they're at different schools? Well, we would come up with a plan to address that. We've done very creative things in the past. We've had a student taking geometry at the middle school level. The geometry was only offered at the high school. So if that would become the case, we would determine a plan to address it it could look different based on the individual needs of the student. It's a good question. Grantsville. So this is a map of most of Grantsville. Um, what I, and, and actually, I should, should say the same thing for Friendsville. Friendsville has a whole bottom, uh, bottom layer that wasn't shown there, but it's really the cafeteria and, and gym area. For, for Grantsville, they have a Head Start wing up at the top um, that is included onto their building. But this is mainly the, the Grantsville footprint for the, the school. And you can see there's plenty, plenty of space. Of course, you all know Grantsville just recently was renovated. And at this time, due to that renovation, there are no, no capital needs at this time. Has air conditioned, replaced roof, fully enclosed security vestibule has everything that we would want it to have at this moment. And then this is the Route 40 model for pre-K through six. Um, and this assumes that the sixth grade could go in the pink area there. And what's not shown on this map is that there's a downstairs to Route 40 as well, where there is a full art room and a full music room. And these are the capital needs slated for Route 40 at this time. We don't have, at this point, Northern Middle School um, on the screen. But Northern Middle School is, I believe Mr. Wasowski said this morning, the top rated school for our school system as far as facility is concerned. And there's very little capital need at this time. So that's another. So another challenge when you look at A and B, because we would be vacating um, one of our best facilities when it comes to capital investment. So option B assumes a lot of option A, but it looks at Route 40 combining with Grantsville. And so we'll show you what that looks like on the map as well. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Grandma Parker. Okay, I, I just have two questions. Is this available, like, where I could pull it up on my phone and just kind of zoom in? Do we have access to this? Okay, and then also, um, limited renovation at Northern Middle School, I feel like, is not going to get us to being appropriate for little children. Like, it seems like that's going to be expensive, right? Well, I would encourage you just to hold that for a second so that you can see what Grimm and Parker is going to present, um, because I think that will 
shed light on that. And then as far as is this available, uh, we have on our website a little box on the main page that says grade band alignment. It's down at the bottom. There's all different boxes. There's one for blueprint. There's one for grade band alignment. There's one for the school closure advisories. So down there, there's a little box. If you click on that, it'll take you to another page that has all of our grade band alignment stuff. And there's a specific link for northern area. That's where we're putting all of our documents. So you can see everything that we talked about at the last committee meetings before um, Christmas. And then after today, once we get everything organized, that uh, to all of today's work will be posted as well so that you can view it. It'll also, whatever our final product will be, will be posted on board docs um, for the board, so it'll be available there as well. So option B, we said combined Route 40 and Grantsville. You can see uh, the current enrollment pre-K through five, and then the projected sixth grade, again, is probably on the high side, but it is a projection. And the state rated capacity um, at 380, that's the projected state rated capacity based on how we're using the space projected enrollment of 342. So this is a map that accounts for pre-K through six, Route 40 in Grantsville under one ceiling. And you will see I don't have it highlighted in pink, but let's see if I can make this work. Sixth grade, sixth grade would be up here in this corner here. And again, this is just one way of configuring it. The principal would have autonomy to make adjustments at the time based on needs of, of the school. Okay, so with that, it's my pleasure to reintroduce Mr. Wolf. He's gonna speak um, to option C. Thank you, Dr. Miller. So I am notoriously bad at microphones. If um, I'm not doing this right, just throw something at me. Uh, my name is David Wolf. I work with Grimm and Parker Architects. I'm the project manager for this project. Uh, 16 years of experience with Grimm and Parker, 16 plus rather. Um, and I also have my colleague, Laura Smiles on, uh, she's gonna be on virtually. So she's gonna do a part of, portion of the presentation. Um, so at, at Grimm and Parker, we're very happy to be um, a very focused educational design firm. So we, we, we stick mainly with educational design. Uh, in fact, we were ranked third nationally in K-12 design um, not too long ago. Um, we have a 50-year history in Maryland. We have plenty of work across Maryland, Virginia, um, the tri whole tri-state area. Uh, feel free to look it up if, if, you, if you feel the need to. 95 plus employees, so we have a huge support staff. And this is all just a bunch of background about us. Um, so in, in our past experience, in our portfolio, so to speak, we have 90 plus elementary schools. So we know what we're doing at the elementary level. Uh, 20 plus ed specs and programs. And what that basically means is it, ed spec is, is, a, is a document that you compile that drives what the um, program and what spaces would be within a facility. Um, 50 plus high schools. So a, a very large amount of educational experience. Um, I also kind of want to just reiterate what the scope of our work is going to be here at this at this juncture. So as Dr. Miller said, we are going to be looking at option C. So really what they've done is said, hey, here's here's an idea where we, we make the middle school a PK through six facility and the high school a seven through 12 facility. How can you guys make that work and function appropriately? So that's really what we're looking at. And at this juncture, we're still looking at a very flexible, kind of malleable solution to that situation that can still change. In fact, it changed this morning, and I made changes in the PowerPoint before you guys got here. <laughs> so um, th things are moving around, and we're getting all kinds of great feedback, and we're really happy uh, to be part of this process. With that, I'm going to introduce Laura and try to figure out how to get her on the screen. I think you might just be able to turn me around. I don't think so. We can't do that. I'm on, the, I'm on Dr. Miller's computer. So everyone can hear her, right? All right. Unfortunately, you can't see her because she's a delightful person. But um, <laughs> introducing Laura Smiles. 
<laughs> okay, hi guys. Uh, I did get a picture of you, so I know how many of you there are. So um, really well attended, and thank you guys so much for coming. Um, uh, kind of to reiterate Dave's points, um, our scope is sort of limited here. So, oh, perfect, yay, hi, oh, yay. Okay, good, hello. Oh, how exciting. I mean, everything is like all darkness, but still really exciting. Hi, guys. Um, so we wanted to talk, thank you, Dr. Miller. Um, we wanted to talk a little bit, kind of taking a step back before we're getting into all the schemes and what is our general approach to K-12 design? Like Dave said, we do a ton of K-12 work, certainly in the in the DMV, um, but my kind of specialty in particular is working across all of Maryland, all different counties, um, and they're they're sitting in dark cafeteria rooms the same exact way you are, kind of kind of trying to unravel what to do about Blueprint and how to, how to um, use your facilities most effectively. So um, you're in really good hands kind of with your leadership team here. Just want to give a huge shout out to them. They're doing a great job. Um, so general K-12 design considerations, got to start at the beginning. The schools on the left here, that's how they used to look. It's a lot of kind of teacher at the front, kind of talking to the kids in the back, and they're really just about absorbing information. Now it looks really different. It's a shift from teaching and more about learning. How are those kids employing that knowledge? How are they kind of demonstrating knowledge, getting their hands dirty, really getting into it? And the spaces that support that just look different than the classrooms that we designed, um, you know, even 20 years ago, much less our facilities that were designed in the 70s. I don't even have walls. So um, everybody is sort of struggling with this as well. Go ahead to the next slide. Great. So what do those spaces look like and what are the qualities of that space that we're looking at? One, we're looking for a variety of spaces, then one that supports large groups, maybe two classes at a time or a larger assembly, but also smaller groups, also individual work. We know kind of responding to those individual learning styles is really important. Also collaboration, we know those, those, that group work is really important and the spaces and the furniture and the equipment that sponsor that just are different than those like individual kind of desks that, that used to be able to, you know, only, only be able to hold one book and one pencil. Um, also, hands-on learning, the, the sort of curriculum is really being employed specialty by you guys is just so much bigger and greater than, the, than anything that was envisioned. And the stuff that really needs to come out <laughs> out of those bins and get to work, you need spaces to really be able to support that um, and effectively. And keep going. That from a prime, oh, go ahead. I feel like. Oh, sorry, go back. I thought somebody was trying to, to, to ask a question that I wanted to hear it. So at a primary level, we know what that looks like, but also kind of at a secondary level that you have to take that a step further. What's the equipment you need? What are the kind of quality of spaces? How can you kind of teach students to think creatively, work with collaboration, that critical thinking? And that just looks different. It's different types of furniture, different types of equipment, and the spaces, again, that sort of like have the power that to really be able to enable that and not kind of get out of the way, um, just look different than they used to. So we want to be thinking about those things. Go ahead. Uh, outdoor learning, gosh, especially after COVID, when everybody was trying to use outdoor learning, I was just trying to be able to gather their classes somewhere that was safe. We did a lot of outdoor learning. But one kind of good tenet of that is we're not just sort of like sitting outside on the concrete. Now we're trying to use those spaces a little more effectively to actually do project work, actually do learning and do curriculum. Um, and we're, we're learning a lot about um, how to effectively do that and how we can plan for outdoor learning spaces and do that well. Keep going. Um, at a secondary level, there's even kind of a, even further than that. It's, you know, sort of like art, being able to do art outside, being able to really connect that indoor and outdoor um, and really, really get um, a more professional grade um, environment to be to be practicing those skills. Go ahead. Um, education. I mean, we'd be remiss to talk about that as a huge trend, having a huge renaissance across um, all of K-12, kind of across the uh, world and country, obviously. Um, but we know that this is something that you guys are doing particularly well, have a very successful series of CTE programs, and we want to make sure that we're folding in spatial qualities that enable that to even programs that don't even exist yet, but might be able to be spurred on by sort of the opportunities to have the space to do so. So we just want to make sure that we're thinking about kind of your what your visions are. And keep going. And then also sort of kind of stepping away from curriculum, talking about quality of space, just 
any spa learning environment, acoustics, you know, you've been in open pot spaces, even, you know, I don't know how, how well you guys can hear me now, but this is obviously not a learning space. We're in a cafeteria. Um, acoustics are so important for students to be able to listen and absorb that information. Um, indoor air quality, certainly after COVID, we know how, how, how tough that could be. And certainly in this flu season, this RSV, this strep, the, everything that's going around, all of that is tied to indoor air quality is incredibly crucial to keep our kids healthy, keep them in school. Um, access to daylight. I mean, that, that sounds like something that you, you know, you would just say, but even data suggests that access to daylight and access to natural daylight can increase, re increase reading scores by up to 30% of uh, you know, just retention and comprehension. That's a huge data stat point. That's, that's really, really helpful to know and make sure that we make that a priority as we design these spaces. Uh, go ahead. And then lastly, you know, kind of how do we think of your buildings as community spaces? How do we make sure that they're being encouraged for community use instead of kind of stepping back from that? So it's thinking about safety and security. How do we make sure that we could give you a, a, a real secure environment, but that's through cameras and locks and everything, but it's also through visibility, safety and security, um, technology. How do we make sure that, you know, again, not what the programs you're doing today, but 15 years, 20 years, 30 years from now, your buildings are an investment. We really need to be thinking about how technology can really kind of propel you forward and after hours access. I mean, it's just kind of being very smart about where we're putting those locks, where we're putting those lockdown points so that student, at once your community is really using your building and we know that you guys really depend on that, how can we do that in a really safe and secure way without having to, to put extra people on duty, to put extra cameras, you know, just making really smart decisions at the beginning. Go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you guys. Thanks, Laura. So um, I just want to kind of point out that the point behind showing some of those, like we're, we're kind of talking about like educational best practices is, you know, with change can come the possibility for transformation. So we really might have an opportunity to make these spaces fantastic. So keep that in mind. Um, so we're kind of looking here again at the northern footprint. How am I doing with the mic? Anybody? All right. Um, so we're looking at Friendsville Accident, Northern Garrett Middle School and High School, Grantsville, we're out 40 elementary school. We are here, as we said before, to talk about option C and kind of discuss how we, what, where we sort of landed with the committees that we've already been working with and to get more feedback from you on how we're doing. Again, option C is PK through six at the middle school, the current middle school, and seven through 12 at the high school. That's just reiteration. Um, nah, duplicate again. So accident in Friendsville, current um, enrollment numbers are here, 235, 138. You add those together, you get 373 plus 42, 415. So if we were to combine these two schools into one at the Northern Middle facility, the current SRC at Northern Middle is 742. Now that number's potentially gonna change because of the grade levels, but we have space there. There's, there's enough space to accommodate these students. In fact, there's roughly 65%, um, and you really do want to have some swing space and some flexibility in those spaces. So we're trying to achieve that. So when there is an ebb or a flow with the number of classrooms, we're able to flexibly accommodate that. So we walked the, the two schools and um, we took dimensions and we gathered all of the existing data that we could and we developed a new floor plan um, to scale. It's accurate, we can, we can go into our software and click on a room and it'll tell us how much area is there, how many occupants it has, et cetera. Um, it's, I guess, important to point out 84,000 <laughs> um, in eight square feet, 742 SRC. Um, so just to orient you, this is the main entrance, this red arrow. The, um, what is currently the community center is here on the left. Admin would be here on your right as you walk in. Dining space is here. The gymnasium is here. The, the majority of the classroom spaces are over here. Um, you all probably know the building. Okay, so part of our first meeting was gathering feedback and data from, from others in the community. Uh, teachers, students, the students feedback was fantastic, uh, parents and kind of collecting that data and compiling it into what we can present to the school board when they will, so that all of your feedback has been heard. Um, some of the things, we separated it up into opportunities and challenges. So we can fully understand, you know, what are the good things about doing this and then fully understand what, where are the things we really need to th keep thinking about. Um, so 
going through a couple, equity countywide, that just kind of points to northern and southern as one county and, and doing a consistent, uh, having a consistent approach to education in that county. Uh, proven concepts serving as Grantsville swing space. So the current middle school is actually was serving as a Grantsville swing space prior to Grantsville opening. Um, creating community, stronger, more consistent family connections. Uh, so there's more students, more people in the building, more ability to make those connections. Critical mass of community support. Uh, it's, this was a quote. It's more about the school community than the building. So um, ex expanded curriculum opportunities. There's a, there could be an increase in STEM opportunities. So you know more exposure to those kinds of, of facilities and more exposure. Um, learning communities, grade pods. There's an opportunity for us to start organizing and um, departmentalization within a, a new approach to, to the layout of the school. Instructional support, teacher collaboration. Um, maximizing support resources full-time on one campus. Thought that was fantastic. Flexibility and staffing, departmentalizing grade bands on teacher, teacher strengths. Um, added value in resource areas. The proximity to Hickory at this facility is, was something that people thought was you know, really, really big bonus. Um, resource teachers would be, could be there all day, every day, and not necessarily have to rotate between multiple schools. Various inclusion spaces could be considered for special education. All regional special ed programs in one facility. Playground equipment, site amenities, and um, animal hosting. Those are all kinds of things that we talked about as a committee. And we'll talk, we can get into the, you know, as we progress on the project, if it moves forward, we'll start to get into the, into the weeds a little bit on things like outdoor learning areas. And, and we were really excited about things like that. I just had a meeting with uh, Dr. Troutwine. Uh, Mr. Troutwine, Dr. Troutwine? <laughs> okay. Um, and he was telling me all of his great ideas about, about outdoor learning and how we can make it educational but also fun. So lots of, lots of exciting things. All right, challenges. We've already heard this today. Increase in bus ride length for some students. So while we navigate this process, we need to develop a transportation plan and have that as part of our data that we would provide you all as well. So that would really play a big part of the, uh, the decision by the school board. <laughs> Extra staff and aides to support new extended routes. So the question there was, with the new extended routes, would we maybe need an extra staff member on a bus, for instance? Um, site circulation, existing northern middle drop off, too short. So I've only been here once, twice during dismissal, but I can tell you that I could see where there would be a huge problem there. Because, first of all, we talked about adding a right hand turn lane to get out of here, but having the bus loop and the parking and everything else kind of all congested into one area is a challenge. So we understand that's a challenge. Um, morning traffic congestion is problematic. I already said that. Limited outdoor space. Um, so, so we do want to take advantage of maybe potentially looking at more opportunities for outdoor space. And you'll see one on the, on the middle school slide when we get there. Um, maintaining plans for outdoor education. We, got, we want to keep what's currently existing as outdoor education and make sure that that stuff doesn't go by the wayside. Um, meeting community recreation needs. Um, so this, I guess, has to do with maybe losing spaces at the other facilities if that was potentially going to happen. So, yes. Sure. Are you good with microphones? <laughs> so, so with that, not only are we losing the gym use of gyms in the other elementaries if this happens you're talking about using the space that's there for outdoor education and playgrounds and such and currently youth sports use a lot of the grounds at both the high school and the middle school so if that goes away we're also losing our youth sports ground and we'll then have to take that elsewhere in the county, which is another drawback because um, now we're going off campus for those um, where it was kind of centrally located for a lot of the families. Um, so are you, are you, because we're not suggesting removing any outdoor activities with these facilities. That was not really what that comment or challenge was about. But if you're using it, but if 
if you're using the space for other area, like if you're building a playground where the football team practices, that that area is not going to be there if you're putting things there now. Agreed. I'm sorry. Agreed. So yes, that is we're we're going to consider all of those aspects to this as we move forward. So the expectation is not to reduce opportunities; it's to increase them. Okay. okay. <clears throat> All right, where were we? So um, student experiences, and, and I think Dr. Miller already touched on this, the class sizes, would they increase? And, and she, she did mention that really they would just flatten out because we're adding more students and we have the ability to do that. Um, the capacity of the cafeteria requires scheduling lunchtime too early. Um, so if you, can, if you consider um, if it's a PK through six facility, the cafeteria at that school is actually much larger than the cafeterias in any of your other existing elementary schools, so they'll accommodate more students. So it's gonna be something we need to make sure will work, but we're pretty certain it's three lunch periods will work just fine. PK through six. Needs to be analyzed, that's the answer. Yeah, so, um I don't know what it looks like at Grantsville right now, but many of our elementary schools run three lunch shifts. So there would be no, there should be no problem running three lunch shifts. Um, the size cafeteria is plenty big enough, and Miss um, Ashby Broadford runs three lunch shifts. Correct? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I actually did. If y'all give me a minute here. Um, Northern Middle's cafeteria is 4,185 square feet. And if you divide that by a factor, this is the way the fire marshal looks at this space, for instance, um, would be seven square feet per person. That would end up being 598 students per, in that cafeteria. Accident would accommodate 214, Friendsville 200. Northern High would be 730. So that's just data driven off of square foot per student. Okay, so that, the, the ratio is equivalent, but you can see that the, the, that school will fit more kids, almost twice as much. Um, okay, must meet square footage requirements for PK and K classroom spaces. So this was a, a hot topic. We previously had, um, I'll get into the plans in a minute. You guys wanna see the good stuff, right? But um, we previously had the PK classes size a little bit too small, um, so we ended up increasing them, and that was the reaction to that comment. <clears throat> All right, moving along here, instructional support. We need to further, further exploration of things like admin support, nursing needs, custodial needs. All of those things need to be accounted for and addressed as we move through this process. So it's, it's something that, as an all-inclusive solution, will be looked at. Uh, further exploration of STARS and ALO support. So special education, of course, would need to be considered as well with the additional students in each school. All right, and then we also heard feedback from, from people that were things that we need to consider in the future. Um, not that all of them aren't, but basically what will student, the student experience and culture look like for sixth graders? You know, how, what happens to, the, to their culture? Um, how, how do we make that better? How do we support it? How do we make it stronger and not, not look at it as a, as a negative? Um, will this new school con configuration affect Title I funding? We honestly don't know yet. Sorry. We, we are in the process of analyzing that. It's a very complex calculation, and so we're working through that process and hope to know soon. And that is with MSDE. We have to work directly with them on that. Right, so I think the, the approach here is like, we really need to make sure this works first and works for the community first before we get into all of those weeds. Um, with increase in resource offerings, will resource teachers have adequate planning time? The answer is, will be yes. All right, so this hey, was, hey, Laura. Sorry, just real quick, I wanna um, put a plug in that 
a lot of those comments were given to us verbally when we had our, you know, kind of breakout sessions and listed those together. But a lot of those really great comments also came from the online form. Something we knew is that not everybody was going to be able to be in the room, certainly on that timeline. So that form is still open. I really encourage everybody here to, to take some time and do that. Not everybody's even great in the room to be able to respond on their feet. Um, and we got some really insightful comments, just taking a second and really being able to write those down and they're going to make um, the design that much better. So uh, we really appreciate Appreciate that and encourage you guys to do that. Right. And at this time, that link has gone to the committee members um, directly. And so those are the individuals who have responded. The intent is after tonight's meeting to do a press release on this presentation and the information included in it. And a link to that same um, feedback form will be provided in that press. But we wanted to have this in person information session before we did that. All right, I'm running out of time, I think, so I need to go fast. But um, meeting number one, test fit. So this is where we landed at the first meeting, kind of before we even spoke with anyone. So um, we're, you know, we're, we're talking with specific team members, but not necessarily a whole committee. Um, so this is kind of where we went. Some of the feedback we got that directly affected the plan is shown up here on the right. Um, things like the, uh, the science spaces, the sixth grade science doesn't necessarily need a full-blown science lab. Like, gas, water, you know, they need water. Um, not necessarily what's at that facility currently. So there might be an opportunity for us to use those spaces differently. Um, Pre-K classrooms adjacency to STARS program could present issues. So we originally had the pre-Ks potted kind of over here because those spaces were the biggest. Not gonna work, right? So we, we, we decided to move those to another location and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, Student storage will be required for all grades, including lockers outside classrooms for grades four, five, and six. Um, so the, the goal there was that PK through three might have cubbies in their classrooms for storage for, for the littles, and then four, five, and six would have access to lockers. That's flexible, just needs to be looked at as far as how many lockers there are. Right now there's lockers in this corridor and that corridor. So this diagram really kind of shows you after we got into the space and started taking a look, what spaces within the building, the spaces that are highlighted and not ghosted out, are the spaces that we might really start to consider affecting. Those spaces might need to be renovated, lightly renovated or transformed or addressed in a way that um, would help make this solution work. So just to point out again, to reorient you, entrance is here. Those science labs are over here. You want to pay attention to what happens there. Um, special ed kind of in the center and the media center here. All right, so this is the plan we landed on. Did I make those modifications? I did. I missed one. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to it. Um, so this is kind of the plan we landed on after, even after today's meeting. Okay, so. Now we've already met with you, we've heard feedback, we've gathered information, we've gathered data, we've processed it, and we started to develop the plan further. Um, so what we ended up doing was saying, since we don't need those labs for the sixth grade students, maybe the, maybe the pre-K students would go in those spaces because th that area is large enough to accommodate a larger classroom. The other areas are not. Um, we would end up blowing out those labs, obviously, and tearing down walls in between classrooms. Um, we could still do that rather effectively and without spending too much money. Uh, toilet rooms in between each one of the PK classrooms, so each room would have its own toilet space, um, which is fantastic. And then an inclusion room in between. So there is an inclusion room over on that side of the building. Now these PK spaces would be, would have direct access outside. They're going to have to, um, because there's different requirements for that. And then they would be able to easily get to the play area, which is planned to be in this space up here, which is to the, I want to say plan north. Um, the K kind of neighborhood, if you will, is right next to that. Again, with toilet rooms in between the classroom spaces. So the, the Ks and the PKs would each have their own individual toilets. We're looking at, um, as we kind of just move down the classroom wing, two, uh, three, four, and five in that general area. So another comment that we got today, which is not really reflected here fully, was that we had a sixth grade classroom right here. It's not great because there's a gym right next to it, acoustics are a problem, and there's no daylight. So we talked earlier about how important daylight is for students. So the recommendation was, let's move that guy here, or girl, <laughs> and then let's 
move the, we had another one here, another six here. Let's move that one down here. So now you have a nice um, transition of six and fifth, which those two, those two grade bands would, would uh, align very easily. If sunlight is important to students, why are the special ed students in windowless classrooms? That's, that's a great question. Um, again, this is going to be a limited renovation. Based on their needs, the best place to, for them to be at that point in time is to stay there because they have shared facilities already. So that space turned out to be, just looking at it from a cost perspective, working. It's also where the existing classrooms are right now. So we currently have an ALO classroom slotted there right now in Northern Middle School, as well as the STARS classroom. So it is existing the way it is now, and we felt that it was the most appropriate to keep them in that space. It's already designed to meet their needs. Yeah. And right. then the other it's thing not. I'll also say about this plan is it does assume um, when you look at kindergarten through six that there are three classes per grade that's probably not our reality you know so it is there's plenty of room i guess at the end of the day is what i'm saying because if we would do this plan today we would have most likely two second grade and two two fourth grade um, but it just kind of gives you an idea of there's not probably going to be three classes per grade, although there could be if enrollment um, required it. We have a question in the blue. Okay, and just one more response to you is that, again, this is in flux, right? So this is a recommendation to try to meet the budget and also try to find a design that works for this facility. So, oh. So... If you're saying there could be two instead of three classes due to cla staff, ooh, not staffing, but students, what what ratio are you looking at to that? And if if because I have elementary kids is why I'm asking, and my I'm living it in accident right now with two oversized classes, um, are you going to provide a teacher's aid if there is over 20 students? Is that like a priority for you, for the board, for the designers, that maybe if we are going to have larger classes because of this, that parents will feel a little bit at ease knowing there is somebody to help. Because right now we don't have that. So remember, it's having more students under one roof does not equal increased class size. It increase, it it equals a decrease in class variance. So there's more flexibility. And what I will say is that we analyze our student enrollment every year with the budget process, and we also analyze our staffing every year through the budget process, and then we staff based on the enrollment. And there have been times where there has to be changes mid-year, and we will continue that practice in order. There's no plan at this time to have a cap on class size or what we would do is if there was specific needs in that class, let's say a student maybe has an IEP or there's a particular general education need, then we may respond and react to that. But w that would be on a case by case basis. Okay. Okay. Duly noted. Thank you. I, I kind of also want to point out too that, not necessarily to the um, teacher's aid, but we we do in this plan this six right here should show a what we're calling a flex classroom. So in the event where something ebbs and flows, we have additional swing space that we can use. Now that does not only have to be used for a classroom; that could be also used for a pullout space or um, intervention or something of that nature. So there's additional space that we can utilize. Right now we have four sixth grade classrooms, so would they be larger? Because right now there are only three in the map. That's, well, so, so she's saying we're only showing three sixth grade classrooms, so this is based on projected enrollment. That we'll, the need will be where are the the four sixth grade classrooms at the currently at the middle school is what they're saying. Right. So right now there's four. Is that, that's what you're saying? Yeah. But remember, 
in this model, Grantsville would still be open and it would house Route 40 and Grantsville and the sixth grade that is associated with those schools would be at Grantsville. Okay. One of them is science. I'm sorry? So there are four. There are four sixth class, six grade classrooms. One of them is the science room. So three standard classrooms and one sixth grade. Laura, science. we can hear you. Well, yeah, it, this this is where uh, Mr. Wolf uh, missed a, an edit there. I think that sixth grade under the, the office. The six by the gym should say flex. Correct. Yeah. I tried so, to make those yep. those changes on the fly before everybody got here, and I failed. At the middle school level, the kids rotate ELA, math, all that. I think that's what she's thinking. There's only three up there. So the sixth graders in an elementary level would actually stay in one classroom rather than rotate. Not necessarily. Okay. We would be looking at departmentalizing in, uh, in a different manner. It would be a scheduling uh, conversation and administrative decisions on how to do that. But we would potentially be departmentalizing not just in sixth grade, in fifth grade, possibly fourth grade. There are other schools that have more than one class per grade level that departmentalize to take advantage of the efficiencies of having more than one classroom per grade level. All right, so I know you all don't want to be here until like 10 o'clock, so I am going to try to kind of fly through the high school without questions and then leave it up to for, for you to for questions and answers toward the end. Are you, are you guys good with that? Everyone? Okay. All right, so now we're going to be looking at the high school. Uh, the current enrollment at the high school, or, I'm sorry, at 7th through 8th graders at the middle school is 208. The high school is 439. Add those together, you get 647. The current SRC is 903. So again, this school has a, a good ratio and a, a room for growth. Um, we went through the, to the school. We kind of did the same thing, you know, dimensions, plans. We, we started to draw up spaces to make sure we got all the areas correct. Um, to orient you, this is the main entrance right here. We are in this space, the dining space. Um, this is the second floor. So we're going to want to be able to look at all the spaces together because this challenge is more of like a shuffling space challenge. We have a lot of spaces that are currently underutilized in this school and some that are vacant. So how can we shuffle, keep everybody ha having a space, make sure all of them have a, a home base, so to speak, but move them around a little bit. It's more of a shuffling exercise. I'll get there. Um, here's, here's the feedback we received. I'm not going to go through every item, but if this is all opportunities. So again, equity countywide, middle school and high, high school mentoring. I thought that was a great one. So that means um, there's a possibility for, you know, of course, there's a, there's a negative impact that could occur by having seventh graders with, mixed with 12th graders. But there's also a positive one that everybody seems to forget sometimes. Those students could eventually end up teaching the younger ones and vice versa or being their best, their best friend, or, you know, like a buddy. So... Sometimes we got to think about the positive aspects of it. Um, more opportunity for extracurriculars with more students. So those students might have the opportunities to be exp exposed to, to more activities, more extracurricular activities. Um, less variance in class sizes. Uh, related arts teachers would have more access to, to students, to more students. So one of the um, one of the great comments we received from the music teacher was that she would be she, she, they already use the seventh and eighth grade students for, for band um, and for for other you know chorus et cetera. So it would be great to have those people in the same building, and she would really like to get have that opportunity to be with them earlier on. So there's an opportunity. Uh, maximizing efficiency of high school spaces, creating variety of sizes of educational spaces to meet individualized needs. Um, teacher collaboration for instructional support, nurse's office increase in size and direct access to the outside, um, various inclusion spaces, and all regional special ed programs in one facility, once again. So challenges. Um, morning traffic was another one. So that's a popular one, <laughs> and, and it's one that needs to be addressed. So we will be taking a look at that. Um, maintaining plans for outdoor education is another one. Meeting community recreation needs. Student experience. The, again, the class sizes came up, but our expectation and our goal is to not have them increase. They will level out. Uh, minimizing unsupervised interaction among grade levels. So w what we've learned previously is that the seventh and eighth grade students, 
it really, this model is really successful if you consider this one school, one facility. It's not like the seventh and eighth grade students are over there, ninth through twelfth is over here. Um, there is a need to provide some separation for safety and security reasons, okay? But we want to make sure this operates under the same bell schedule. It operates as one school, and, and it, we need, for success, it has to do that. Um, again, instructional support, admin support, nursing needs, custodial needs, all of those things we discussed. STARS and ALO support, all of those things we discussed. Uh, and the future considerations are very similar to the previous ones. Uh, what will student experience and culture for seventh and eighth grade students look like? You know, we have to consider that. It's, it's a big change for them. So we need to make sure we understand um, everybody's feedback. So far, what we've heard from students is that they like the idea of having less transitions. So at that age, I've got two teenage daughters, and <laughs> the transition's tough, and it's daunting in some cases. So having one transition might improve that. It, you know, could be a possibility. Um, how will this affect community and school-based... Ah, sorry, guys. How would this community affect school-based recreation activities? And we touched on this earlier today with the question. So all of these things need to be considered in the future. With increase in resource offerings, will resource teachers have adequate planning time? Again, the expected answer is yes. Okay, so this was the test fit the, from the first meeting. So again, the comments are on the left. What we had been talking about is on the right. So this diagram will get bigger. You'll be able to see it better. Um, but the feedback we got that was fantastic that really started to drive the plan changes was that the seventh and eighth grade science is not sufficient to meet curriculum needs. We had previously shown a space where we took this, the existing science lab, which is rather large here, and sliced it in two to make two. It wasn't working out. Um, lab spaces may not be sized appropriately, so even things like the art lab might not be big enough. Music rooms should be divided into two separate areas. So this came from the music teacher who was completely on board with this, like I mentioned earlier. And she said, my space is a little too big, which is not the normal <laughs> comment, right? Um, and so, but, but we came up with a plan where we could divide that space in half and maybe have two music areas there, which would be great for synergies between students. Um, a portion of the existing media center could be repurposed as counseling spaces um, and inf informal meeting spaces. Apparently, there's a huge need for intervention areas in this school, um, small group meeting areas, you know, spaces for teachers to meet with students one-on-one, -on -one, um, et cetera. So here's kind of where we ended up. I'm going to point out the square footage in the, in the SRC again, 121,803 square feet. The SRC of this current facility is 903. The planned enrollment is 678. That gives you a 180 square foot per student, which is a really good number. Um, it's, it's a good goal. And just for comparison's sake, I can't figure out Southerns right now off the top of my head, but um, Accident Elementary School, if you look at its square foot per student, I think it's close to 100. And apparently it's got some capacity issues, correct? Maybe? A little over that? Okay. Bad comparison. Okay, we'll keep going. Um, so this plan is looking at basically the highlighted spaces are the spaces that we have maybe available to us to manipulate. So um, what spaces could potentially be underutilized or even vacant, right? So these red arrows represent where those spaces might end up in the proposed configuration. Again, all in flux. Um, so immediately when we walked this site, we looked at this wing right here and said, you know, that has enough space to, to accommodate the seventh and eighth grade students, and it would make them have their own little home. Um, how, what can we do to make sure we have a space that's adequate for the existing teachers in that, in that area? Right, so the math wing is over there. The math wing could potentially come up here, and we can fit all four, all five math spaces in that, in that location. Um, ALO could potentially move over into this location and potentially have its own kitchen. Um, the SRO is currently here, which is, you know, a pretty far distance from the main entrance. So would it be a good idea to move that SRO maybe closer to the front entrance so that there's, there's a window there, there's clear visibility, better safety and security, so if there is a threat, that person can walk straight out of his room or her room and mitigate it. Um, 
We looked at, at moving biology potentially upstairs. Now, there's, there's, in this case, that space right there was underutilized. Currently, it is a home economics lab, and then right next to it is an office space that was open. Uh, if we tear that wall down, that, that space is big enough for a biology lab. Uh, there is a space here that was is previously used by the theater teacher. Um, uh, just as an example, at Southern, they, the theater teacher teaches on the stage. The theater teacher is on board with doing that. So they would be taught right back here. Uh, so that space could be open. The teacher's lounge upstairs is rather large, so that would maybe move somewhere else. And right now the idea is that it would move downstairs a little more centrally located. So more supervision, more, more staffing um, right up front and supervision of the, of the main corridor and the main entrance. Um, the SOS space is here, and that could potentially move down. The JROTC, there's an office space for the JROTC, which is actually a classroom we learned today. Um, but that space could fit near the JROTC um, lab. Um, so that would actually free up this to potentially become another lab. So I'll get to that in a minute. Okay, so... Uh, can everyone read that back there? That blue and the black is kind of bleeding together, isn't it? Can't read it from right here. That's right. All right, I'll point out the spaces. Um, yeah, that it's got a different coloring than it does typically. But the seventh and eighth grade community is generally located in this in this region right here. So we have three seventh grade classrooms, two inclusion rooms, eighth grade science would would keep the same space as the, the science, the biology that was there. So there's really no renovation needed there. And then seventh grade science would go where the ALO, ALO currently is. Um, as you can see up here at the music wing, uh, the, the concept there is to really kind of almost gut that whole space um, because there's, there's issues with code for egressing from one classroom to the next. So the best opportunity is to really kind of gut that and reconfigure it. Um, so we have one classroom on one side, another classroom on the other, and then shared practice spaces in between. So that's great, great for acoustics because the more space you have between those two spaces, you're not going to have like music bleed over. Um, the math spaces that were here would move into this math wing here. So we have one, two, three, four, and they're all, I'm sorry, four of, out of five of them are adequate in size. No, that's, not, that's the wrong word. Four out of five of them are comparable in size to the existing ones. Uh, in fact, I think the square footage is higher on two of them. So those teachers in, in those spaces would not be moving to a smaller space and making a sacrifice. Um, there is a, uh, currently there's an ag classroom right here. That space we would look at maybe reconfiguring that lab and getting the ag classroom into that lab and providing a better space for supervision and teaching in that, in that area. The tech ed um, would, would be a shared space, so tech ed potentially separated by a wall um, for the high school and tech ed for the seventh and eighth grade students for project lead the way. <clears throat> um, now, so what did we do with the rest of the, so SOS moves to this space here. That's really a, just a simple, simple move. Um, the SRO you can kind of see right here now, so that's the safety resource officer, uh, security resource officer, and then we get these four kind of small meeting rooms in that media center space. And those meeting rooms could be used for teacher-student intervention, but they could also be used by the students for one-on-one -on -one learning, collaboration. Uh, and then right next to that is where the teacher's lounge would go. So there's enough area in there. We just have to do a pretty substantial uh, surgery to the, the tearing walls down, et cetera. Nothing, nothing structural. Um, the, the nurse's space, we do have an opportunity to get more space for the nurse because there might be an increased need for students at, in the nurse's office. And then high school biology, you can see here, that space is over 1,000 square feet, so it's moving from a comparable space to another air, space of the right area. And then we are looking at the 7th and 8th grade arts upstairs. So if, you, if you're a 7th or an 8th grade student, you would walk up these stairs right here, come out up here, and then move to your seventh and eighth grade arts. It'd be a fine arts studio, okay? Um, there is currently only one stars space upstairs. We are looking at enough room for two for the added need. Okay, um, we're also kind of looking at these 
areas and some of the some of the science labs we have in this facility are uh, underutilized let's put it that way um, the the furniture the casework all of those things are not necessarily as flexible as they could be so as we're looking at these lab spaces it would be important to look at more flexible furniture uh, put the utilities around the perimeter don't have those big giant stations that really limit you to one use of that space so you could look at lab tables on wheels that can be easily docked up to the casework um, and and when we have to do experiments you, you know we may still need things like gas and water but those things could be around the perimeter So we also looked at a couple of other ways to arrange the math suite. At the end of the day, the committee landed on this one was the best. I'm gonna go through them quickly, but this is where we kind of, the whole group landed and said, that's the best arrangement. We appreciate you looking at other arrangements because there were other people in the room that wanted us to. So we looked at multiple options and it's still as flexible as that currently. This is one arrangement that could happen this, in this arrangement, you end up having four, four high school maths in the, in the math wing, and those teachers would be moving from a rather large space for a classroom to a relatively small, but it's still manageable space, and we didn't feel that was the right move. Um, in this scenario, we would be looking at all five high school maths in, the, in this math wing, but two of them might be smaller and that gives you some flexibility for uh, varying class sizes, okay? So sometimes an AP course, for instance, might only have seven or eight kids. Could you use a smaller seminar space for that? Uh, the, the consensus was that's not really our favorite option either. So like I said, we landed here. And at the end of the day, the ag teacher said, you know what, we can make that work. Because that, the, the, the um, confrontational side of it was coming from the ag teacher. <coughs> Okay, so with that said, I kind of want to make sure you guys all know that there's a question and answer period coming up. That's going to give you the opportunity to uh, provide us with any feedback, and we, we really implore you to just, you know, let it all out. So whatever, whatever feedback you have, we're going to document all of it and make sure it's all public. Um, Dr. Miller, would you like to talk about next steps and then do the questions and answers if we have time? Oh, our computer's going to die, so we might have to say goodbye to Laura. Uh, I, just need to get, I just need to get my cord. Um, I don't want to lose Dude. the computer. <laughs> um, so we will go ahead and do some limited um, back and forth. We've obviously heard several concerns and questions already tonight that we've documented. We are at 810, and we do want to honor everyone's time. We know that this is you know, a weeknight and we have Friday to get through. Um, there will be a press release that will include a link that will allow you to provide feedback based on what you saw tonight. So you, you heard a lot of information and, you know, it I would advise you to kind of allow that to process, maybe go back and review that, this document, it'll be posted along with the press. And, um, and then again, you can feel free to um, add comments electronically. But we will do um, a few comments or questions um, here to wrap it up as well. Oh boy. Oh, can we, can we, <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, Dr. Miller. Um, can we tailor the, the conversation as opportunities and challenges again? Sure, opportunities okay. and challenges, yep. I was just wondering, um, like speech therapy and OT and PT, is where will they be housed or where will they be doing their services? So at the secondary level, my understanding is most of that happens in the ALO space, but can you speak to that, Dr. Mangus? Yeah. we. So when we started this committee on the southern end, that was one of our parents' big focus that were a part of that was to really make sure we had dedicated spaces for those services. So um, for those of you who are not aware, sometimes those are shared spaces in our schools. And so we made sure, um, and, and I have to flip back to the map, but we do have spaces outlined in this plan specific for those services. So like Dr. Miller said, sometimes those happen in the ALO setting, but sometimes those are for students in the inclusion setting. And we um, dedicated spaces where they would have kind of that private area for those uh, more intensive therapies. Question. 
Yeah, so on the elementary plan, there was an inclusion space in between the two pre-Ks. In the secondary plan, there were those little um, C rooms in the library. They would be uh, a perfect place for those types of services. That area there in red is actually the current speech space, and we kind of left that around. So it could be a conference room or a speech space. So we have multiple outdoor space usage at Accident right now um, and have worked really hard with donations from communities and improving that, such as an apple orchard, a barn coming in, outdoor space, things like that. Um, that was not listed on any of that. Does that just get scrapped if we have to move or does that move with us? Um, because that was a lot of time and effort from the community, not so much from the school, but from the actual community that was put in for a lot of those things um, that I know as a parent, I want to see that go where my kid goes because I invested time and money with that. And I do believe Friendsville has a greenhouse from what I understand. So what happens to that? So we'll add that to the list to explore. There, there'll be opportunities to look at that. So I saw some of the capital projects that needed to be conducted for the elementary schools. Uh, you left it out for the high schools. I didn't see that, or for this high school particularly. It's clearly an aging building. Um, it's great that you want to do some of these proposed plans to this building. That doesn't fix the fact that it's still an aging building. Over the next five to ten years, what is the feasibility of replacing the building instead of dumping this money into it plus the capital uh, plans that need to be done in the future. <laughs> okay, I'm not gonna answer that one on the spot, but we will document it. Okay. Right, so we have to work with the IAC, the state, and our local to fund any type of capital project, so. I was just want. Oh, I was just wondering under plans option A and B. Is there any renovation for the high school? Because it stands there's four classrooms in this building that aren't used right now, so I don't see how we could accommodate those almost 200 more students without the renovations. And regardless under any plan. Sorry. Which can you restate? Yeah. I have a hard time. I for some reason. Under plans A and B, is there any renovation that will happen to the high school under those plans? Because there's. Okay. Yes, so A and B, all of the options, options A, B, and C, will assume that 7th through 12th grade would be at Northern High School and would also assume that a limited renovation would have to happen in order to accommodate them. Sorry, I couldn't, my ears were, were not. I just kind of like don't know how we got to this place where we were taking away middle school completely and the Northern End didn't get any input. I specifically emailed in March of last year and said, please set up a session for Northern parents. And we were just told, wait, just Northern school, wait, just wait, just wait. Well, we waited and now middle school's gone. Like my child, I have to send her to high school in seventh grade or find another option for her if I feel like this can't work for her. So I'm, I'm just really having a hard time that Northern community had no input. It's just gone. Duly noted, but I would, I would say that the Northern end decision has not been made by the elected board. So. Okay, I understood. Um, my question is just about the cost of each option, if that is, if there's any rough estimates there or if that will ever be presented or when that might be available. Yes, it came up in the committee as well and Ms. Schweitzer. I, go ahead. So the, the capital cost, which is what you're talking about, we really needed to do this exercise and figure out what needed to be done at Northern High School what would need to be done at Northern Middle School if it were to become Northern Elementary School. But we also needed to dig down to what it would take for all four of those elementary schools to retain sixth grade. 
So now that that work has been done, and we did not want to assume anything. We wanted to have community feedback on where those spaces, the use of all of those spaces. And as you can see, we've changed it even today. We, you know, we came up with a test fit. We, we've changed these seeds a, co a couple times. So we, we don't have an estimate yet, but as we get closer to what a good plan is going to be, we will most definitely have a capital uh, estimate as well as an operating you know, total cost of ownership. Oh, I'm sorry, Nick, Dr. Yeah, Miller. Yeah. Oh, this gentleman's been waiting for a yep. while. And I, and I got some in the back as well. Has the southern end been decided what we're going to be doing over there as far as the moving to the middle school, correct? That's been voted on. So southern end has been voted on. OK. Is the students from Crellin, the sixth graders, will be going to Crellin as well? There's going to be a feasibility okay. study done for Crellin this spring, correct? Okay. Into summer? OK, that's being looked at. 7-1. Yeah, July 1, feasibility okay. study for Crellin. Okay. Currently not enough space. This is good. See, I thought they were pretty well capacity and we've talked a few yes. years back. So I've like. yes. been doing this for about 15 years with the schools back and forth, as folks know. Um, I've attended several school board meetings over a year ago, Swan Meadow. You know, we're moving them to the middle school if they elect to. There was one gentleman there that evening, said he had several children. They're already at Swan Meadow. He said, that's not a problem. I said, I have two at home that would be going into school, but we'll just probably move back to West Virginia or homeschool the children. I, I think the board needs to look, and I'm asking our Board of Education members to please consider waiting on what happens at the southern end, because I'll guarantee in two years, the student population is going to decline 50 to 100 students easily. It's going to drop off. The northern end, I mean, Axton Elementary is probably the closest, but Route 40 bringing them into Grantsville. But for Friendsville, the students are going to be on a bus for an hour, 15 minutes to an hour and a half. Depending on our, well, we'll have to look at the analysis so, of that. So, yeah, please do. But yeah. I mean, unless you're going to hire more bus drivers, but I mean, right in town where I live, but anywhere in Friendsville, that area, trying to get there, the children from Axton trying to get on the outskirts at the bridge getting in and up here to the middle school. So when you're talking to three, four-year-old children, those ages, I would, I just feel very difficult. And as people are looking, do you want to move to Garrett County with a family? I don't want to bring my family out there because they're closing schools. For the last 10 years, we've closed dozens, close to half a dozen schools, elementary students. So people are, it's really, the population is continually declining. Another gentleman said about the high school, it was built in 1952, was the first graduating class. 70 years ago, the school opened. So it's going to have major renovations needing here. So we're going to do all these renovations. Maybe we need to consider keeping our community schools, which is in our Board of Education handbooks, keeping Axon Elementary and Route 40 schools down there. Do we want to send those kids back to Allegheny County? Maybe we do. We, in 20 years, we won't need but one high school and maybe one or two elementary schools in Garrett County. I don't know, but we need to think about this, folks. Instead of just jumping the gun, let's see what's going to happen on the southern end and evaluate in a year or two and then look at this option because I'll guarantee you that you're going to see a, a significant decline on the southern end. I'm, I'm sorry, but that's just the facts. I know that's the expense, but we haven't closed any schools in over 10 years. We haven't closed any schools in, since 12. And we have a new governor going in next week. And and Friendsville, because we were saved, because Charlotte Siebel, the school board president I attended, which we're going to Annapolis next week, met with the lieutenant governor's office and helped to get Garrett County some money to save the schools. We were bleeding. So the new governor, we're one Maryland. We're in this together. Let's ask this new administration, hey, can you help us out? Help us out a little bit to try to build the county up. The county commissioners, the Board of Education, we need to get economic development and get families in here. So we need to work together as, as a whole. Sorry, thank you. No worries, thank you. So going on that, if we could, if that, is that even an option for us to look at how the Southern End like, is there a deadline? Like, is that an option to see how the southern end does before we drastically change everything 
on the northern end. And piggybacking on what someone said earlier, if our goal is to mirror southern end and northern end, has that been a plan for a while or is that just now coming up? Because like we said last year, when the southern end first started, you know, we were like, we said we were told to kind of hold off, hold off, hold off. So I'm just asking, is, is that feasible? Is there a deadline or something we have to meet? So to have two different grade bands is going to be a complicating factor as far as access to programs for students on the north versus programs for students on the south. We are unlikely to be able to provide the same number of opportunities on the north if we keep the existing footprint and allow Southern to move forward. So there's gonna be more opportunities for Southern students. The other thing I will say is some of this is dependent or impacted significantly by the blueprint. We have to submit our first initial plan by March 15th. Then we gotta submit another plan by March 15th of the next year, and then there's another one after that for the course of the 10 years. Mr. Stolp referenced earlier today in the committee meeting how challenging it is to put on paper with a state who's gonna hold us accountable for outcomes for college and career ready to show on paper that we're providing these additional opportunities for the students on the south, but are unable to do so for those on the north. And the complexity of developing that blueprint plan across all five pillars for multiple grade bands is gonna be a real a real barrier for our county and actually to get what we need to get as a result of implementing the blueprint. And that's what we're gonna be held accountable to as far as performance. So. I can, I can sympathize with that. I understand and I think we all understand that running two different models on either end of the county would be very difficult, but was everyone not on the same page last year when we were told hush, wait, your time will come, don't worry. Because I think that's the biggest concern right now for so many people in this room is that no one was given a voice here at all because you, other people, um, other committees, so many committees asked us to just wait. And I think that that's deceptive. Do you wanna address that, Ms. Baker? Well, I would go back to the other person's question. Um, you know, is it feasible to wait until we see what happens at the southern end? I'll reiterate, uh, we have two elected board members here tonight, so I can't speak for the whole elected board. They have not made the decision. So nothing is off the table. They're, they're, the options are all still being considered. So to answer your question, I think it then goes to your question. Um, they have not made a decision and they are taking all of this feedback into consideration before they do so. There is no required timeline for a grade band realignment. There's, there's nothing that requires it to be made immediately, although Dr. Miller did speak to the reason why, some of the reasons why we may need to do so. But right. the decision has not been made. So I, I do sincerely believe the board members are taking everything into consideration before they make a final decision. Right. If we do go back to February of 2022, there was a present presentation uh, to the elected board with a proposal for the entire school system. And at the end of the day, for a variety of reasons, the elected board wanted to look at one one area at a time. And so that's that's what we're doing. We're looking at the next phase, which is the Northern M. The other thing I will say, and then I have a couple other hands, is we have looked at other grade bands. If you go to our um, website and you look at our work historically, all the way back into the RISE situation, Dr. Lever's presentations to the board, there before we landed on the February presentation of 2022 to the elected board. And in fact, that presentation prior, the, the month prior, there was a presentation from Dr. Lever. We looked at other grade bands, other than pre-K through six, seven through 12. Through that analysis, we landed on the best option for our county moving forward, 
was looking at a more specific analysis of pre-K through 6, 7 through 12 based on what we had learned from those others. So I just want to make sure that people understand that we did look at other grade bands. This has been a very long uh, season of work. It was the recommendation of Dr. Lieber, uh, his presentation, which was a consultant. It seems that the board is kind of saying that our hands are tied because the Southern decision is made and it would be too hard to run two separate grade bands. Is there any feasibility of reopening the Southern and looking at it as a county as a whole? Because we aren't Southern Garrett schools and Northern Garrett, we're Garrett County public schools. I feel like we need to look at the interests of the entire county, not just we made Southern's decision, Northern, you're just gonna have to deal with it is what it seems like. Okay, we will write that down. I think we have one. Hey. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry, so during the committee meeting today, I actually asked this exact same question, and forgive my language, but I asked, can Southern be guinea pigs? And we talked about it. Um, and one thing then that we discussed as, was, if we allow Southern to have the grade ban for two years before Northern considers it, Southern gets the 100% opportunity to create the curriculum themselves. And then if it is you know, feasible and it does work out for the Southern end and it finds out that Northern needs to adopt it, Northern as a community, our faculty members, they're not going to be able to have a say. We're just going to be adopting the entire Southern program here at our school. So unfortunately, like I know I've been around and around, but um, by adopting the grade band earlier, we have at least a chance to have say on curriculum guidelines and how it's going to affect our students directly instead of just following something that the Southern end of the county does. What's the plan for administration as to how it's going to be split up in the support staff for the administration? Okay, so once the elected board makes a decision on our footprint, then the next step would be to look at appropriate staffing plan based on that footprint. Right now, there's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of committees, as some of you have referenced, and a lot of advisories. And to be most efficient, we need to know what the footprint, what we're planning for, then we can build a staffing plan for that. Um, we'll do we'll do three more and then we'll go ahead and wrap it up because it is coming to um, three th and I'm going to try to go to people that I haven't gone to. Hi. Um, so in looking at um, what was presented tonight, I mean I think that's that's lovely to look at and that's a that's a great building plan. But I feel like um, some of the elephant in the room is that we're talking about removing three community schools. And, and we know enough as Garrett County citizens to know that we've done it before. It decimates communities. We are champion across the state for having rural schools. I mean, look at Crellin. Look at the notoriety Crellin gets. We are, I mean, we're on the map everywhere because of Crellin. Um, and we know this. And so, though this is lovely and it looks functional, um, I'm not sure really that we're considering the impact of destroying three community schools. Um, I'll just give you an example. Um, these people here are my Route 40 people. Um, we're really close to the school, as in when we're needed, we're there in five minutes. Um, we always see each other there. Um, that's huge. We use the school for outside purposes. It's a gathering place. We celebrate things there. The kids feel warm and cozy. A um, lot of us are products of that school. I went throughout 40. There's nothing like it. Um, and I'm trying to think of, you know, these plans talk about departmentalizing elementary schools. Because the facility is so great and because staffing might call for that, you're talking about, um, I don't know, third, fourth, fifth graders moving from language arts to math to social studies and having multiple teachers. That's huge. Um, but also, I picked my daughter up for, for an orthodontist appointment today. It took me a half an hour to get here. And it took me a half an hour to get home. And as much as I know these people, and I know that we all would love to be so involved in a new school with, how many students would be 
300, three, 400 people, um, it doesn't look the same. It doesn't look the same as Route 40 with 100 kids with one teacher each and everybody knows everybody. Again, I'm a product of that. Lots of people in here are a product of the school system in this county. So I would implore the board and, and everyone involved in this decision to really think about communities like Kitzmiller. Um, I mean, even Dennett Road, and Dennett Road is part of a larger space there, but that had some detrimental effects that I think we're not talking about. And so I really, I really hope that the board considers the profound effects it will have on communities. Duly noted. I would just go back to, at the very beginning, we said our four elementary schools will not look like the four elementary schools that we currently have on the north, given the constraints and requirements that we're going to have to implement based on outside factors. So that's something that we also have to consider. Did you have your hand up? Thank you. Um, is there or was there a plan that actually left the middle school open or is there opportunity to consider that plan? And then for Davey, a question. With putting the seventh and eighth graders into a high school, is there any more exploration on really making that their own wing? Like Stephanie noticed maybe there wasn't a bathroom located in the seventh and eighth grade space in the high school. You did mention it, it might not be a bad idea to let the kids move and intermingle, but could there be further explanation, exploration of a same seventh and eighth grade wing where maybe those kids didn't have to move as much through the high school building? Started you, the first yes. question. I have Miss Baker writing that down. Oh, okay, so so yeah, I mean, um, high school plans not up there. We, we've learned a lot of different things from these discussions, and one of them that came up was restrooms. Um, so it's hard to read. But we are looking at restrooms in this location right here. Okay, so we do think that they want to have their own restrooms. And we did hear today, this is just goes back to the conversation about this being an older building, that the facilities here currently are not adequate. So, you know, th those kinds of things are things, that, opportunities that we can look at and address as we move forward. Again, as long as the budget allows that. Um, for instance, having the male and female on each end of the corridor, that's not exactly great. I make the wrong turn every time, so. Okay, we're gonna end <laughs> with a student here. Um, will there be in the high school enough bathrooms for both the seven, eight, and the high schoolers? And how will you do like cafeteria shifts? Cafeteria shifts are administrative decisions, scheduling. So just like any other year, we would more than likely, we'd have three shifts. Right now, Northern High School has two. They have had three shifts in the past, um, but it would be a scheduling decision. So that that's a simple fix, and we have bathrooms down as a delay noted area that we're looking at. So with that's that, correct. did you have something else? I said to add? that's correct. Okay. Um, we appreciate everybody's time tonight. Thank you for coming out. Be on the lookout for additional press, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. <laughs>